but I'll, let, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you to all of you. Well, it's interesting when you start working on a program like this and you start doing research, and first you think, oh yeah, this is so interesting, you find all this stuff, and then you realize that you're totally overwhelmed and overloaded with way too much historical information to put in one presentation. So then we had to focus back down on the, the dot, what we're supposed to be doing. So our heads are loaded with information. Um, I don't know how long we'll be able to keep it, but probably, <laughs> as, probably as long as for questions afterwards. <laughs> so, um, so I guess we'll just get started. And I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then Ted's got something really cool to do, and then Laura's going to talk, and then I'm going to finish, and then we're going to have a special encore surprise at the very end. So again, if, if it, even if you're getting like a little bit bored, hang in there for the ending because it's going to be worth staying. Um, okay. Closer? Can you hear me? Okay. Alright, I guess we're ready for the next slide. Um, so you recognize this, right? This is what the harbor looked like um, last month at least. And um, when Laura and I were going through trying to decide how to present, we decided we're just going to do a straight chronological history of the dock that seemed like the, the, the easiest thing to do. So just kind of think back about 163 years ago um, to when Peter Doherty landed here. And um, we don't I don't think he came on a Mackinac boat, but he certainly would have come down to Elk Rapids probably on a Mackinac boat. That's, that was the main mode of travel at that time. Um, I understand that when, when he came over to Old Mission, it was in a canoe um, uh, paddled by four Indians that, that brought him over to Old Mission. But that was, that's the Mackinac boat. So there's Peter, Reverend Peter Doherty. Um, he always seems to just be the, at the heart of all of the things that we do. <laughs> um, this was a really interesting sketch, and I don't know if many of you have seen it or not. I found it in a book. Um, maybe, maybe you've heard of Helen Hornbeck Tanner. She was a, a, a noted um, cartologist and historian, and really helped um, back in the days of the Gilnet lawsuits with um, the treaties. She was an expert on Indian treaties. She taught um, in Chicago. And uh, she, she had this sketch published in, in 1840 that Peter Doherty drew himself of the peninsula. Um, and remember, he didn't have the Google Earth or any way to do you know, an aerial shot. And there really weren't very many good maps at that time. And so it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty good when you look at it. And I don't know that you can see it real well. But um, I wanted to point out a couple things. There's a, there's, the one is where the current Old Mission Harbor is. Two, he said it's um, where the old chief was, and that's up to the right, way up, kind of north of Elk Rapids up there, that's where the old chief lived. Um, three is a village about, it was an uh, Indian village about halfway up the peninsula, six miles up, when he got there. And I don't know if it's the chief of Bosa or not, I know he was, he was in there, I thought he was closer to the base. Here's my favorite one. Um, number four is down right at the very base of the peninsula, um, and it says two or three Catholic families. <laughs> and what's kind of ironic is it's almost exactly where the Unitarian Church is today. <laughs> so, um, but that seemed to, not yet. That's okay. That seemed important. Um, and I think five was where Omina was. But so, yeah. <coughs> Oh, uh, five, six, and seven are small Indian villages, and you'll see there's one up sort of in the Sutton's Bay, Omina area, and then way up at Northport, there was a, there's another one. But I think that's pretty good for him to just kind of draw that freehand. Okay, um, the next slide, we have um, Nancy um, Jero to thank for that. She was out in a kayak paddling around and, and took some pictures. But this is a slide up when Peter Doherty came. Um, a lot of people think he, he landed at Old Mission Harbor, but really where he ended up, um, and where he put his dock, and, and you'll, as you think about it, you'll understand, because of where the Doherty House is, was at the base of Mission School Road. And so um, the, the nautical archaeology students 
from the college and, and part of that society where I'm investigating, they found the pilings. And, and that's what you see here. So you can see that um, sort of, I don't know, the southwest bank then of the harbor. And, that's, and the dock stretched out about 100 feet. By the way, I hope you all have the chronology. There's more information in there probably than what, I, what I'm talking about. Um, okay. So then um, people started coming in 1845. In the 1840s, um, there were the, the Indian agents came and a few farmers. Um, there were three stores. Mission. <laughs> Lewis Miller, A. Paul, and Colson Campbell. I'm just going to read this to you. It's what you see on the screen. Um, Mr. Coles also owned the schooner Arrow. We tried and tried to get any kind of a picture or sketch of Arrow, and we couldn't find it. So if any of you run across it, it would be a good thing to have. Um, and that's what brought supplies and passengers to Old Mission. And um, S.E. Waite, you've probably heard of him. He was an important figure in Traverse City history. And he and his family moved in the fall of 1850. And they came in the, the schooner Arrow, owned by Coles and Campbell, and the in Old Mission. And it said this boat was making weekly trips between Mackinac and Old Mission at that time. Um, so I, I kind of wish we knew, we knew what, it, what it looked like. Um, and then the, the next slide is the schooner Madeline. And um, in the winter of 1851, it was pulled up at the dock, and you've heard of the school ship Madeline, I think that's, again, an important um, historical boat here, and that's the one that was restored by the Maritime Heritage Alliance, that they sail all around now, and, and um, Essie Waite was only 17 years old, and were, um, he had a class of four other people <laughs> that he taught, and were the, the crew of the Madeline, and, and worked on that, so that's, that's what that looked like at the time. Did that were at Bowers Harbor at home? They were at Bowers Harbor. Yeah, we threw in, we, well, at one point we were going to do all the docks in the whole area, so <laughs> we, narrowed, we narrowed back, though. Um, this next, the next thing I'm going to um, <coughs> let you know about, um, Laura discovered a treasure trove of artifacts found in an issue in their historical museum, and I took a trip down uh, about six weeks ago. And uh, went through as many as I could. There's still a lot more. And it was a bag, a Bagley family collection donated by um, Ted's great aunt, um, Mary Rosecrans Bagley. Uh, and so there are all kinds of really interesting uh, letters and information. And this one that I uncovered um, was from the United States Land Office, um, Morgan Bates. He was the register then. He ended up becoming editor of the Grand Traverse Herald and again an important uh, figure in Traverse City history. And this was written October 30th, 1869. It's in response to a letter by David, um, Bag David M. Bagley, who would have been Ted's great-grandfather. And um, David was living in Lansing at the time. He was a clerk in the land office down there, so that's probably how they, how they knew each other. And so, um, Morgan Bates wrote to him and he said, D.M. Bagley Esquire, my old friend, your letter of the 7th, October 7th, has just reached me. It's been 23 days on the way by the Lakeshore Road. Mm -hmm. So it, it took a while. <laughs> you couldn't just text him. Um, <laughs> Lightning is nothing to this speed. I hardly know what to say about your selling the land on the peninsula. It is worth all of that and will bring more money by and by. The peninsula is destined to be a great fruit garden, and your land is well situated for that purpose. If I wanted the money real bad, I would sell. If not, I wouldn't. I'm so glad you've got a good winter job on work that you are so admirably fitted to do, as ever your friend Marvin Bates. So evidently David Bagley hung on to his land, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, it, and it turned out real well uh, for all of us. Um, one more slide, and then Ted's going to read us a speech. Um, this is, this is the, the Bagley genealogy. I didn't go into all of it with the Pratts and the Marshalls and all that because I would have a lot of slides here, but um, an important family on the, on the peninsula. So that was David Allen. The, the letter was in, in 1860, um, it was 67, 69. Um, and then um, 
William D. Bagley came here, and he lived 1851 to 1936. And, and William D., his son, married, first married Harriet Parmalee, who died in 1886. Now, you've all probably heard of George Parmalee, who owned a big piece of that land out on the north of the harbor, the Leffingwell Preserve. He was born in 1817, and I, his name was actually George Washington Parmalee. <laughs> kind of interesting. Um, and, and, but she died young, 1936. And they also had a baby, Margaret P. Bagley, who died at 18 months. And um, that's Patty Parmalee's grave, and it's in the Lakeside Cemetery, which I'm not sure. Is that your cemetery? Yeah, okay. So that's, remember when Ted did the Lakeside Cemetery, cemetery tour? That's where Patty is. And then William D. next married Emma Pratt in 1888 and had four children, um, including um, Edward H. Bagley, Ted's father, Mary Rosecrans Bagley, who's the woman that donated all those papers, um, John Bagley, and then Catherine Bagley, and I put Marshall in parentheses, but is that right? Is that correct? Okay, good. Because then she married the, into the Marshall family. And so Ted and um, Catherine Bagley, he was, she was his, um, his aunt, great aunt, great aunt. So, I guess up next is Ted, and let me just, like, let, uh, you go to that. But let me just um, kind of give you an intro to this. Um, the, you know, the Grange was pretty powerful around all during those early years in the Peninsula Farmers Association and so forth. And they would meet from time to time in different spots. Well, this time they met in the Grange Hall, and I think maybe it was down in the basement of this, because this was served as um, where the Grange would meet. And so um, we found at the MSU collection this speech that, and it, what's, what's really cool about it is, you could see it where he crossed off words. I mean, it was the, the draft of the speech that he was going to give to the, to the Grange. Um, and Ted has agreed to, to read it in his place. And he gave that to the Old Settlers Association in the Grange Hall in 1927. So it was read by his grandson, Ted. Thank you, ma'am. Old Settlers Association Annual Meeting, June 22, 1927, Old Mission, Michigan. Our welcome to visiting fellow members of the Old Settlers Association. The day has a particular significance. 88 years ago, in May 1839, Reverend Peter Doherty landed on the shore of this harbor and on this very spot began his beneficent work, attended as it was by incessant toil and privation, and sometimes in peril of his life. And for what? Certainly not for earthly gain or fame. This spot might justly be called the cradle of civilization of the Grand Traverse region. <laughs> we who are here assembled today are greatly indebted to the heroic sacrifices of that educated, refined Eastern family. When we consider the pioneer work among uncivilized races in most other places in this world, attended as it has been by degrading vices and cruelties introduced by the white man, and compare such practice with the pure and ennobling teaching, both by precept and example of the Gordies and other pioneers in this section, we who succeed them in this beautiful region cannot be thankful enough that their good influence has so greatly helped to make our own lives better worth living. This important fact should be kept perpetually in mind as a guide and example for us to carry on the work that they so earnestly began and so nobly advanced. Again, we welcome the visiting members of the Old Settlers Association of Old Mission to the renewal of old friendships and the making of new ones. Thank you, William David Thank you. Do you have anything else you want to say? If you do, that's good.
Wow, didn't you just, we should have like dimmed the lights and just, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of old settlers here too, right? <laughs> um, I recorded um, Ted reading that too on a separate recording that we'll have on CD so that we'll have it for posterity. Okay, uh, I just have a couple more things here. So, those, those old settlers that um, William D. Bagley was talking about, they started coming in droves, especially once the Civil War ended and the land became available to people. And you can see in 1881 how that was platted and filled up with, with people. Um, let's look at the next slide, too. And this is a close-up of the same one. And what I found interesting is uh, I don't know if you can see the dock, but it has a T on it. And I don't know if you, those of you that remember the dock, if you remember seeing that. But um, that's, that's the first time I saw that. Um, and that whole property uh, to the east, I guess it would be, of it um, was all called dock, dock property. Yes? I don't remember the T, but I was in there with my grandfather. It was an enclosed that had a roof over the top. Oh. And uh, you could look down into the water and see fish. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah. I remember that. I must have been about oh, seven or eight years old. You're, you're talking about the head of uh, going out the door to go. Well, this is the, oh. Well, this is the Hasbro now. Oh, that has right Yes. Right. Okay, so that is the door. Yeah, um, I forgot to, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. Um, the, they used the door to dock then in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And then the Hazrat drop dock was available from, I think, 69. Oh, that's my, that's my next slide. Um, this is how I got the name, the big dock. Uh, and, you know, as, as happens when you do historical research, sometimes you find um, information that kind of butts up against information, and it's not quite the same. And so, I don't know for a fact, I only saw this in one in one place, but this says that Terry Hanna purchased land from Henry Stepney in 1864 and probably built the first dock known as the big dock located where has our beaches today. And used until 35 when it burned. Um, and so I thought that Parmalee owned the property and perhaps Perry Hanna came, my guess is Perry Hanna came out with the lumber and all that, his, his people had, had built the dock. But, um, I thought I'd throw this in here just so we can have a point for discussion. Nancy? Was, was the Hazarot Bay uh, dock, the big dock, in the same exact place as the dock is now? I don't think it was the new. No, I think it was a little bit um, like west. I, I don't know my Towards answer. the playground. Towards, yeah, towards the playground. Um, and then in 1869, the Omission Dock Company was formed and actually sold stock. And you'll see I put that in your chronology because it was the act that, that actually that, that passed that made it, it illegal. And wouldn't it be cool to have a piece of the a paper certificate of the stock today? If anybody does, I keep hoping I'll uncover it sometimes. Um, Harbor Masters. So George Parmley, George Washington Parmley, managed the dock until his death in 1885, and then it was managed by William B. Bagley, I believe right up through the 1920s or so. Um, it's a little sketchy. I wasn't finding a lot of information on that, but that's my, my guess. Um, we, we found a page from an old phone book. I think it was a citizen's phone book, that if you wanted to call the, the, the harbor master at the dock, it was simply one. <laughs> so, so that's how important the dock was. That, that would be the first, because I think the end was nine. She was, she was telling us it was a single digit also. Um, one more, I have one more to do. And that is, um, this again was in the Michigan State Historical Archives, and I know you can't see it, but I, I feel like I needed to put it up there. Um, and it was the, it was the taxes that William D. paid on the dock, on the dock property, along with some of his personal property. And it's the one, um, who's on the left? Well, I probably didn't put him up in the right direction. There we go. <laughs> it's the one right up here in the middle. $31. No, I'm sorry, 
sorry, thirteen dollars and seventy-eight cents. And even at that time, they were paying um, school taxes, township taxes, county taxes, state taxes, just like we do today. And I forgot to mention again, it's on your chronology when we were talking about how many people moved in. That in um, I think it says in eighteen. I don't have, 1859, there were 44 students in um, the old mission school. And that's, you know, maybe there are only like four big families, I don't know, but still. You know, <laughs> that's, a lot of, that's a lot of students. Okay, I think Laura and I are going to do an exchange right now. Go ahead and show the next one. Um, I, I should have introduced everybody. Our tech support tonight is my son, um, Steve Swain. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Thank you. 